for the ice cozy coffee just in time. Okay, so we might as well begin. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Lee Duncan, and I'm going to talk uh, a little while today about ice cozy. Um, if you haven't heard of it before, it's kind of interesting. If you have, maybe I'll add a, one or two things you haven't heard of. So if you have any questions, just let me know. I think we'll, with this few people, I think we'll have plenty of time to answer. This does take about 40 minutes. So. I don't think that's on my screen, whatever that is. Somebody wrote on there. Okay. So, a little bit about my background. Um, I work for SUSE. Uh, I work remotely for SUSE. They're based in Germany and the Czech Republic, and I work from home in the Portland area. I've worked for them for about eight years. I've worked for several other um, large computer companies, almost all of it in storage. I kind of got into storage by accident when I wanted to work on the kernel. And I, uh, they said, here's a tape drive, nobody wants to fix the bugs for this. And I just love working on the kernel and storage, so um, I think it's a good place to be. I have to put the bits somewhere. I uh, do some, I maintain actually upstream of the SCSI <coughs> project with one other person, and that includes some kernel code and a user project. And I do all of the kernel and user land initiator and target stuff. Thanks. Come on. Thank you. So uh, today I'm going to talk about iSCSI. As I said, this is kind of a, a summary here. Um, so what is it? Why do we care? A little bit about it. A little bit more about it. Um, so jumping right into what is iSCSI. iSCSI is pretty simple. It's just SCSI over some sort of transport. Um, it's been defined 30 years. I don't remember exactly when this RFC here is the main one was written. Um, but it's been around a long time. The idea initially was to just do it over TCP IP Ethernet, but the standard expanded to include other transports, like fiber channel and thin band, for example. Um, and there's other RFCs that kind of have expanded on that, replaced it, but really this is 3270 is the Bible. And all it does is encapsulate SCSI commands and responses, and it has a few other extra things to be able to manage the fact that you're not really on a SCSI cable mostly management type things like connecting and disconnecting. But that's it. And that way, and using it, you get remote storage, but it can look like it's local. And so if iSCSI is just SCSI over the internet, then what is SCSI? Well, SCSI has been around here longer. It's a, it's a protocol that allows computers and disks to talk. Um, it has a client server kind of a model, but it calls it the initiator and the uh, target. Um, there's a, a communication between them, and all of the modern day, and usually always, I'm sorry, always the computer initiates the communication to just never says, hey, I want to do I.O. unless you've initiated So that's the protocol. Um, all modern disks, the high quality server style disks and tape drives speak SCSI. That's the, the protocol. There's a subset of that called ATA, it kind of developed independently for PCs, and it's now kind of similar to SCSI, but it's not the same. So why do we care about SCSI? Um, because it's free. It's free and it works. It's everywhere. You can get it on Windows. You can get it on Linux. You can get it on IBM mainframes. Um, you can get cards that help you do it and do all the work for you if you want, adapter cards. You can, uh, you know, there's disks you can buy and have it built in. It's just everywhere. It's ubiquitous. And you, you don't need any special hardware to talk to it generally if you have an Ethernet connection, like almost everybody does, even over wireless. It might not be great over wireless, but it could be done. Um, so anywhere you have a network, you can um, have ice cousin. I'm hoping to close the door. And so that might help. I was going to do that. Thanks. Okay, and it's, it's well maintained too. There's still a lot of contributions to it. It hasn't like, you know, uh, gone stale and nobody cares anymore. But it's also in a good curve in its life where it's, it's not new, but it's uh, not changing. So, so it's not changing so fast that things are breaking all the time. And uh, it is, as I mentioned earlier before I started talking, uh, I think almost everybody who's here, it is currently used in a lot of storage products. Um, our company has one called Suzy Enterprise Storage. 
I'm not trying to sell that one, but that one uses Ceph and uh, iSCSI for the connection uh, from the clients into the Ceph cluster storage. And there's other products by many people that do a similar thing. Like maybe not Ceph, maybe like ClusterFS is another example of a back end. So it's used a lot. So let's talk about the basic building blocks of iSCSI. It's really sim simple once you have these uh, building blocks. I mentioned initiators and targets earlier, just like in SCSI. And so you have initiators and targets. And SCSI adds on the uh, additional layer of a session. A session is when an initiator connects to the target. It actually does a thing called a login, very much like logging into a computer. When it's done, it disconnects. Um, so that's the session is that life in between those two. And the error recovery, there's different error recovery levels. And the most common one is throw away the session and start over. Um, and it, like I said, log on, log off. And uh, in Linux, because we're talking about Linux today, the, there's, these are the packages that we're mainly going to be playing with. Open iSCSI is the one that I help maintain. And that's the initiator. And the <coughs> target CLI is the target we're going to use today. That is the most common target these days. There's probably four or five different free software targets you can get for Linux. But this is the one that we kind of focus on in SUSE and that I'm going to talk about today. It's actually the free branch. So there, this is a case where there was a, a project and a company owned it and they started acting wonky. So the community said, we're going to branch that off. And the old one died. So there is no target CLI anymore of what's still around, but it hasn't been touched for five years. And everything is in that free range. So uh, here's a little picture I'm going to show of how the iSCSI maps onto a simple network. Here you have you know, a, a client and a server and <coughs> some kind of storage or you know, disk or tape. And iSCSI maps onto it pretty simply. And this is, I, I show a switch here because generally you're going to do iSCSI in a local area network. You're not going to do it over a wide area network. You need something perhaps a little more robust, I think, if you're going to try to go between here and Chicago for your storage. Uh, but these are very handy in a computer room, for example, or a business, small businesses, large businesses. And there's the packages. And uh, one thing that's unique about iSCSI 2 that I didn't mention earlier is that it gives everything a name. It's a textual name. And there's several different, there's two or three different formats. This is the most common one. It's called an iSCSI qualified name. And it has the format of IQN, followed by the year and month. This is like reverse DNS. So this name authority is like uh, oracle.com or you know google.com. So that's the, and the, the com goes first and then Google, because it's reversed. And the year and the month is when they got that domain name. And once they own that namespace, then they can put anything they want under it. They could have, like, I don't, the limit on the length of the name is pretty long. <laughs> you could have really long names if you want. The only problem is you got to type them in. So, and uh, another difference here is that SCSI and iSCSI you call a disk or a tape a logical unit. So that's what we'll be sharing as a logical unit. So in order to do this now, I'm going to show me going through the steps. I'm not going to do a live demonstration because that can go wonky in so many ways. So, but I did go through these steps and recorded them so you can kind of see the progression. It's really easy to do. Um, and I did it all on my laptop too, yeah. except for the tape part. So we, we're going to need a target and an initiator. So let's have the target first. So we'll have something to shoot at with the initiator. And the things we kind of care about are listed here kind of a high level things, where the bits are going to go, what are we going to name it, and who can get it. So if we get into the nuts and bolts of actually creating a target now, using the target CLI that I mentioned earlier, there's two steps to it. The back end, th this is its, the way that it breaks down uh, the organization of its architecture. <laughs> um, so it creates a back store and then a front end. The front end can be one of several different flavors, and the back store can be one of several different flavors. I'll show a picture in a minute. So this is where you want to put your bits. Is it going to be in a file? Is it going to be a tape drive or what? And then this, the front end is the, the metadata that we talked about earlier, the name, the IP address that we want it to be a, uh, available at. Um, and then also, there's a, the logical units that we set up on the front end will point to the back end. You said file there. Can that is that like a file that's emulating a disk? Yes, and that's what I'm going to show actually. Okay. Because uh, on my disk drive here, I don't, I don't have any spare partitions. 
on my servers, I usually have to uh, leave a spare partition or two so I can do this. But on the di here, I don't, so I just set up a 10 megabyte file. The target CLI -like command is pretty interesting. Um, if you get a chance, just play with it sometimes. It's, it's kind of modeled after the shell. So you have directories, you, it can be interactive, or you can call it to do one thing at a time, just like a shell. Um, you CD to different directories, you can LS. The similarity kind of ends there. You also have variables. I'll show you that in a minute. But it makes, in the old days, before this interface was there, you had to do all, all sorts of weird, long um, script commands to create a target. But this makes it really easy. So here's the directory tree that it's going to present to us. The root node, which has no other purpose than holding all these other nodes. And then here's the back stores. And here's the front ends. This is the one we're going to care about here. So, yeah. so these other ones, these other front ends, you might ask, what are they for? They're all different front ends for virtualization engines. Um, this target code is highly um, tuned to be able to use, uh, use it in virtual, virtualized environments. So those give you a special backstore for those. Uh, and file I.O., I'm just playing around with highlighting here. I couldn't help myself. So I just got to see file I.O. is what we care about. So let's look at how it actually works. Hopefully you can read this now. Can everybody kind of see that? <laughs> OK. So uh, you can see here, there's my prompt, and there's a the command I type, and then it gives me this prompt after giving me some startup information. And I type ls, and it shows me a recursive ls, because that's the default list. So uh, you can see all those same nodes that I just showed. Uh, oh, recursive. Uh, yeah. OK. If I get too far over, it's hard to see it. Thanks. Um, so here's those same nodes that we just saw a minute ago, right? Here's the root directory. And then here's all the nodes under it in blue. And then another layer down is red. It uses a lot of color coding to make things which is handy, makes things easier to read. So this is our tree right here that we saw a minute ago with circles. And then this is metadata. I call it about each node in the tree. And it's kind of all empty, so that's why it's white. Color coding again, and um, we'll see it change in a minute. So this is an empty tree. I've started up my system with no targets. It does actually have memory, right? So if I, it's, I don't know if you know that, but it does. So it automatically saves. If you exit and then come back, it would have what you did before. But I made sure I started with a clean system. So let's do the backstore first. As I said, it's going to be a file. And I, got, I have room for a 10 megabyte file. And that's big enough to pretend it's a disk. And I'm going to put it in this backstore directory that I have. I'm going to make an empty directory. Hi. I'm going to. I'm going to create an empty directory uh, where I want to put my storage in the back. And then I'll let it create the file for me. And the advantage is that it uses sparse files by default. So I can tell it 10 megabytes. And if you have a sparse file system, a, a file system that supports sparse files, then it'll you know, be zero bytes, essentially, or almost zero bytes until any of it is used. Uh, and I'm going to just give it this name. And it doesn't really care what the name is. And then I'll create the front end, and I'll put in the metadata about the front end and connect it to the back end. I want to, uh, for my access control list, I'm going to leave it wide open. You can actually do, you can actually do it differently if you want, uh, and I'll show that at the end. But we're going to, for demo demonstration purposes, we're going to let anybody connect it anywhere, no matter what their name is. So now I've typed in this one line here. Sorry if it's a little bit light. But basically what I did, so the format for every command in this shell is the same. You give it a directory name, where you want to run the command. And that's optional. If you don't give it any directory name, it uses your current directory. Then a command to run in that directory. Each directory has its own commands, right? The iSCSI directory has different commands than the vhost directory. And then the arguments to that command. So I'm saying go to the file IO directory and create a back end called my file one and put it in this file and make it that big. And it does that. You can see it. The green says, oh yeah, okay, no problem. <laughs> and here's a, the whole directory tree again now. You can see this my file is new, all this stuff. And now we have some green over here. Uh, also notice that this, this is deactivated. This is one of the most common 
problems people have when they start using this. They say, well, why is it deactivated? Because you haven't connected the front end to it yet. So here I'm creating a front end, just one line again. See, so far I've typed two lines and I have the front end and the back end created. In this, I say go to the iSCSI directory, this one right here, and run the create command. And here's the name I picked. And this, this, if you actually try to pick an illegal format, it won't let you. It checks that it starts with IQ. Um, and I own this domain name, so I can name it anything I want. And so it creates some automatic stuff for me. You'll see that in a minute. So now here's the whole directory tree again. You can see this part is now new. And this, it created for me because of a variable I have set. I think it's set by default. that says whenever I create a target, this is a wildcard that says, allow any of the NICs on my system to connect to it. If you had several, you could just put it, just the one of them you wanted to use there if you wanted, and it would only connect through that portal. But we're saying let anybody connect. And this, we can ignore this. It does that by default for us. It's not really used. So now I'm going to CD into this directory right here so I can do some commands without having to type long names. And uh, I, wait, notice too that the prompt changed. The prompt shows you what directory you're in. So now let's fill in the front end and connect it to the back. Only a couple of steps required. So this is the directory where I'm at now, and here's what it looks like under me. Same thing we saw before, so let's fill it in. So in order to do demo mode where you can let anybody connect, you have to set a variable, an attribute actually. So you say set attribute, and this is what it's called. This is in the man page. And also you can say set attribute return, and it will list all the variables. But So I know this is the right variable. This is, oops, excuse me, went forward too fast. This is uh, what I call demo mode. And actually, the man, the man page calls it demo mode. I don't know why they just call it demo mode. <laughs> but this tells it, anytime somebody connects, fill this in for me. So it's like a wild. And we also want to, in demo mode, unless you tell it otherwise, it leaves everything read-only, because <laughs> it's a demo. So, no, I want it read-write. Okay, and that's just that variable. Attribute. And now I create the LUN connection, which is this thing, pointing to the back end. And I give it the name. I go and say, go to the LUNs directory and create a new LUN with this backstore that I created earlier. And by the way, this command is really, it's really cool because if you type like slash b tab, it completes it for you. It's got command completion, like any good shell should. So here I'm showing what I've just created now. This was already there before and this is still empty, but I've added this. And it's connected to the, you can see there, the back end file. So now let's look at the whole thing. If I cd back to root and did an ls, there's everything. You notice uh, over here, too. it's activated now. So now I have a uh, target. So let's look at uh, the initiator. It's a little simpler. This we're going to use the iSCSI admin command. This is not a shell. This is just a command and you pass a parameter. It also uses two phases, although they're different, to connect to a target. This is not based necessarily on the protocol, but on the way that the open iSCSI packet works. And so the way iSCSI admin and iSCSI D, the daemon, the way they work is first you build up a database of, well, so let's say I know there's a target out there and I know where it is. So first you have to build up a database of targets. In this case, it's only going to be one. You have to go to the target and you have to say, give me a list of all your loans. It's called send targets. It's built into the protocol. So it says send targets and it sends me its list of targets. And then I build up a database of all those targets. Now I can do things with them, like log into them. So, sounds more complicated than it is. So first we'll do discovery and send targets, and build up a database, and then use a database to establish a session. So here I am on my laptop again, and now I'm going to discover the target is still sitting out there. So now I want to, I'm going to show you that the node database. This is the command to say, show me your node database. None. So I'm starting with an empty, no targets, no. And this is the command to say, show me all your connections. No sessions. So I have no sessions and no nodes. I'm empty. So now I'm going to go out and do discovery. And that's going to build a database of nodes, hopefully. And so I tell it I want to do discovery mode, send targets. And this is the target I want to talk to. It happens to be my same box. And it finds it. 
If there were several, they would be listed one per line. So now I have a node database, theoretically, yes, there it is. I type, look, show me your nodes, and it has one. And I say, show me your sessions, so oh, still no session. So I also want to show I only have one disk initially before I connect to this. So now I say, go to the node database and log into every single node in the database. Well, there's only one. So that logs into it. You can see here, logging in, yep. Now I have two disks. So magically, now I have a second disk. Right, so this, you can see the value of this. I mean, uh, you can set it up to do it at login, and your disk would always be there, and log out, and then it disconnects, and now you have another disk, and it's across the room, and maybe next door. And also, I want to show, now I have a session, too, before there was none. So it keeps track of sessions. And you could say, log out of that session, too, if you give it the command to do that. So now I'm going to kind of quickly go through the same steps, but for tape, I'm not going to go as slowly because we all it's, it's pretty much the same steps. The only difference is we're going to use a different back end, and that's the beauty of that architecture, that you can have the same front end and a different back end in the target. So here's a target. I'm going to set up an empty system again, and now I'm typing this command. So you can see instead of doing file I.O., I'm going to use, where is it? PSCSI. So PSCSI is just pass-through SCSI, and it's a, it's a backstore that they put in to cover cases that uh, you know, aren't necessarily a disk or a disk partition or a file. And in this case, tape fits into that. So any SCSI device would work. So I say go to that directory and create a backstore, call it my tape one, and use this tape drive, which I have on my laptop. And it doesn't. So now I say, show me the backstore directory. And you can see this is new, but deactivated. Now I'm going to create the front end here. And I call it this time tape one instead of test one And it creates it, as it did before. And I CD to that directory, and now I set these attributes for demo mode that we did earlier, same ones, except they do them both at once. And then I create uh, connect the front end to the back end. That's what the one does. And this is my back store that I just created. Boom, it worked. <coughs> and now there's the whole tree. You can see this looks just like before, except this is here instead of there. Why was the, is it okay to ask questions? Yeah. Okay. Why was the ACL uh, equals one? Are there different modes for it, or is that ACL? This one? Yeah. Yeah, this has either a zero or a one, and this is demo mode. So if you set it to one, it automatically lets anybody connect. Okay. And if you, it defaults to zero. And zero is? Zero is not demo mode. That means you have to have an ACL for every single person that connects. And uh, are those stored in a table of some sort? Or They're stored right under, if we had any, let me see where that picture was. They would be listed here just like one per line. Where, where is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong direction. They would be listed here, one per line, just okay. like this. And is that a, a, a in the format of it, is it? It's just the name. It's just the name of the initiator. And then that's a whitelist? Yes. And then and the name is? Is the initiator name whatever. It's like this name. IQN dot whatever. Right. OK. Every open iSCSI comes with a default name, or you can set it if you want your own name, too. So every name, if they just have to be unique, that's all. So I got a, so the slash you have your your database your connections listed under one of these your devices listed under one of these and rules on another one okay okay I think I'm following a little bit okay I'm gonna talk about uh, access control just a little bit at the end okay. there's some other security we can do too besides that but this is wide open security this is no security insecurity Okay. Just for the demonstration purposes. And like at home, I set it up this way because I'm the only one in my house, so I don't have to worry about anybody getting to my stuff. Yeah, so this is, um, now we've got, uh, I believe, was it connected? Did this say activated? Yeah. So now we have everything connected just like we did before. Now let's go to the initiator. Now this time, instead of doing it from my laptop to my laptop, I did it from one of my servers to my laptop because my server does not have a tape drive. You can see there, no tape drives. So now I do the discovery, just like we did before, exactly like we did before, <coughs> and it finds it, and there's the, the name that 
We just created the tape name. And now I tell this, my server to log on to my laptop and create a session. And it does. Now I have a tape drive. And just to prove it, I have a tar file on that tape drive, so I'll show you. So there really is, that's, take my word for it, that's the real tape drive coming across the network. So that's all that. As you can see, it's really no harder than sharing a disk. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can make this stuff practical. I mentioned earlier how nice it was if you could have it do this for you when you log in and then undo it when you log out. So I don't know how many people are familiar with System D. System D is pretty much hated and liked by everybody. I wouldn't say anybody loves it except maybe the creators. Uh, but System D is now the thing in Linux that controls, it used to be a NIT that starts up everything, restarts it if it needs to be restarted, shuts it down, it controls services. And so what we want is, for example, iSCSI uh, initiator has a daemon, so we want that daemon to be started up when the system starts. And then, um, so I'll show you the services we need to do that. There's one service for the target, and there's two or three for the initiator. The only reason you really care about this is if you want this to be available all the time. It's one thing to sit there and play with it, but it's nice if you have a disk that you really want to get to all the time, you want it to just be there as a service. <coughs> So here I'm showing, uh, this is the systemd control file for the target. And if you don't know systemd and this looks like Greek to you, that's fine. The part you probably care about is what it does when it starts up. It runs this command line. And when it stops, it does this. So normally you configure this to start up when the system starts. You can start it up manually if you want if it isn't already running. And whenever it starts, it does this. And that just runs a target CLA command, which we saw earlier, and it says, it defaults to the root directory because it doesn't specify a directory. It says restore config. So it just restores the configuration that was saved when you start up the server. That's all. And when you stop it, it just clears the configuration. So one thing I want to point out here is that if you're going to use target CLI, use the service. Because if you don't use a service, target CLI will work. But then now your configuration is going to get rip, um, stepped on if somebody starts up the server. It's pretty easy to start. You just say system control enable target CLI. There's three services uh, that the initiator uses. I think we only care about two of them. So iSCSI UIO is another daemon that sits parallel to iSCSI D, and you only need it if you have certain brands of uh, convergent network adapters, helper cards that can do the iSCSI for you, and it talks to them. We, are, we don't care about that today. So the two we care about are services are here. IceCSI D and then IceCSI, and this is the daemon I was talking about. System D has this really neat ability to do socket activation, they call it, and so IceCSI D takes advantage of this. So there's, a, there's an IceCSI D.socket file and there's an IceCSI D.service file, and they are hand in hand. And what it boils down to is that System D is waiting for anybody to talk to IceCSI, and if anybody tries to talk to IceCSI, it starts it up. Simple as that. So that's what socket activation does. And then on top of that, that just gets the daemon running. Then we want to layer this service on top of that service. And this is the service that says, log into every node in the database that has a special flag that says I want to log into it. I'll show you that flag in a minute. And then when it stops, it logs out. So these services together give you the daemon and then give you all your sessions automatically. So here's the iSCSI D one. Yeah, again, here's the part we care about. That's all it does when it starts is it just runs a daemon in the foreground. And then when you stop the service, it just kills the daemon because there's no stop line. And you can see here I mentioned the socket activation. That's all there is to it. Here's the one for iSCSI, and this one is layered on top of iSCSI D. It says that somewhere here. Let's see where it's going to say it. After. It's got to be there, right there. And, um, this is, I told you that every system has a name. This is where the name lives for iSCSI. In this file, it's just a file name. You can change it if you want, but it comes at default filled in with a random name. The front part is a random, just the back part. And, but you can change it and edit that file, and this service knows about that file, and it won't run unless that file is there. That's what that means. So that's it. 
So I mentioned that uh, the, the login service only logs into nodes that have a special flag set, so you have to manually set that flag. You can't actually change the default. The default was in a file and it said uh, iSCSI called uh, initd.defaults, I believe. <laughs> I might be saying it wrong, but I'll look in a second. Um, anyway, in the defaults file for iSCSI, you can change it. The default is to have nodes be manual mode. Manual mode means you log in when you want to log in and you log out when you want to log out. But if you want the service to work, you have to change it to automatic mode. It's just a string in the database, a name value pair in the database I'll show you. So again, we're going back to the node database that I told you about. Now we're seeing, I'll show you some of the value of this node database. It gives me a summary of the database entry, but there's really like 50 name value pairs in this for each node. So what we're going to do is just change one of them. So now what I'm doing is I say, show me every entry in the database, but I don't want to see all 50 of them, so I'm just prepping for startup. Startup is the one I want to change right here. And this one doesn't matter. Crazy, but true. So this manual is what I need to change, and it's just a text string. So now, just in one command, I can do that. I say, go to the node database, every node in the database. I only have one, so I'm kind of cheating here. And I say, update this entry to this value. And I check it again and it's changed. So now this will be automatically logged into and logged out of if I have that service running. Okay, almost done. I want to talk about uh, security and iSCSI directory service mentioned in passing and uh, TCMU runner, which is perhaps the most interesting thing. And I also want to mention you could do all the steps that I just did with the target and the initiator with our system administration GUI. I didn't show that because that's kind of proprietary. It's, I mean, it's not proprietary, but SUSE's is different from Red Hat's. It's different from Ubuntu's. So, but you can, ours is called YAST, and it's really simple to do. And uh, I just did a talk um, like this, but I showed the GUI, and it's, it's actually much simpler. And you don't have to like that, that database changing from manual to startup. It does that for you. But I'm not going to show it. So let's talk about access control, kind of what you were talking about earlier with the name. So I showed a wide open <coughs> demo mode. But normally you, you don't do that. Normally you just create one ACL for each initiator. And if you only have two or three, that's pretty easy to do. And so the ACL is just the name of the initiator. And it's, as you mentioned, it's a whitelist. So you have this guy and this guy and this guy can, can connect. That really isn't very secure though, because anybody can say it or somebody and it's not validated, there's no authority. So there's also, that has two other places you can add a name and a password. When you do discovery, you can have a name and a password for that. So you can't even discover my list of targets unless you know the special name and password. You can also say you cannot connect to a session unless you have the name and the password. You could do both of those or you could do just the session and leave discovery wide open if you want. So those are pretty good. Those help quite a bit. But it's not real security. I want to say down here, this assumes a secure network. <laughs> and it has never really been fixed. I would like to see that fixed. So you could do like in a hostile environment, exchange keys and stuff, but it does not do that. So <clears throat> the name and password are passed in the clear the very first time. So if there's a bad guy on the network, it's not secure. And uh, when I asked the original designers of this, how do you fix that? They said, use Gerberos. So that's nobody wants to use Gerberos. Um, Okay. I also want to mention if you set the name and password for discovery and session for both of them, they have to be different. It's required by the protocol and it just kind of silently fails if you don't do that. But if you're using open LDAP for authentication for passwords, then you're using Kerberos effectively. Oh, good. For read behind the scenes. Yeah, but this doesn't use that. So, so you, even then, you, what you're saying is SUSE has a, 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 a directory, active directory thing for Windows, which is basically open LDAP with extra active domain stuff and is it's not compatible with passwords and users that might be for the SUSE directory management stuff? No, this, it, I haven't heard of anybody tying it in with any better form of val validation. And I would have to hear about it because it's free and open software. They have to, if they do it, they have to contribute it. So when you said, um, you asked the developers and they said use that, that's hypothetically if you were going to do it, but we haven't done any of that. Is yeah. That, okay. I got it. Yeah, they meant like secure your whole network. Use pre-IPA or something like that. Some kind of equivalent to active directory. 
But again, this is perhaps another good reason why iSCSI is generally within the computer room or within the organization and not across the wide area network. Um, so I want to mention directory services too. So someday in the future, one could hope maybe there would be thousands and thousands of targets out there. This is what uh, the directory service is kind of designed to handle. Uh, the, it hasn't really been needed because there isn't thousands and thousands of targets. But it kind of you know, answers the question, how do I find where the targets are, or what systems they are, and what name they are. So it's kind of like you know, a domain name service for computers, but for iSCSI. And uh, so it requires a daemon, and a daemon runs on one server, and then remote systems can query it. Um, targets would register, and then initiators could query for a list of targets kind of thing. One of the neatest aspects is actually it has asynchronous notification. You can register to get asynchronous notification, and then you can find out if your target went away, which is not easy to do. <laughs> um, iSCSI actually has as part of the protocol a no-op that it can send periodically, like a ping, to make sure the target is still there. But generally, that's a bad idea because that interferes with heavy I.O. If you get heavy I.O., your no-ops can time out. So people generally leave that off. And so you're not going to know if your targets went away until you try to do I.O. Unless you have some kind of asynchronous notification. And in today's world, iSCSI is being used for cloud services where people are having thousands <laughs> of disks. And like it's very common for one to go away and never come back. Or it might come back in a day. So uh, that's the directory service, and I hope to do a talk about that someday, maybe when it's a little more needed and popular. Uh, so now the last thing I want to talk about is uh, TCMU Runner. Uh, anybody who's been doing new target stuff these days has heard of TCMU Runner. It's like the next coming of Jesus or something. Uh, people like it so much. <coughs> and it, it kind of answers the question, how can I write a new back end for my blah, blah, blah file system um, without having to write any kernel code. Because all of that t all of that target stuff is in the kernel except for the command that we're running. So I'll show you a picture of that. I have, didn't really show you any architecture pictures before because it wasn't really important, but now to talk about this, we kind of have to mention it. So we're focusing on the target over here. Here's an initiator, it's just simple. It actually has a kernel and user too, but we don't care. So here's the things we already talked about. Here's the command, and everything else is in the kernel. As you can see, here are our front ends, here are our back ends. Oh, I missed piece of here. Oh, there it is. Um, right, and then these talk to certain things out here in user land. So what if we wanted to add a new back end, and we don't you know in kernel programming? Well, the designers came up with this TCM, which is the tar target kernel mode. Okay, anyway, the TCM and LIO both mean the same thing. They mean the, uh, the kernel code, kernel target code. And so TCM user is just a new back end, and all that does is it passes things up to a daemon, and the daemon has plugins. It's got a really simple plugin uh, interface. So, and it came with a couple of plugins, and you can write your own. So this is GlusterFS back end, and this is QCow for using a uh, live vert, virtualized storage for virtual machines in Linux. So this can, this can talk to a, a virtualized disk, and this can talk to a cluster. And you can, there's also one for um, Ceph. The Ceph people initially were doing things differently, and now they're doing them through TCMU Runner. It's, it's hard to overestimate how much value it is not having to go into the kernel. The kernel, it's not just hard programming. It's like pulling teeth getting things changed in there. You know, you have to submit it, and you have to get pummeled by people <laughs> that don't like what you did, and you have to change it take years to get changes in there. So anybody can do this. I think that's about it. That's because it's easy. The command line isn't that scary. And you can make your own storage area network. Um, I have these slides on SlideShare. If you want to get to them. And you can also always email me too. My email is uh, on the beginning and on the next page. This is where a lot of the sources are here, these GitHub projects. They're all actually, this is like a, a overview. Uh, Open iSCSI has several packages under, including iSCSI and Target CLI, and this is the directory server I was talking about, TCMU Linux there. Last thing I want to mention is build service here too. I didn't talk anything about that today, but this is where you can go and you can create packages and you can build them for free. 
uh, open SUSE has this, and you can build like Red Hat packages, Ubuntu packages, all you need is an RPM and so forth. So that's very handy, and that's where a lot of these are built for me. Okay. For my job. Okay. My email if you do need to get in touch with me, feel free. Thank you. Oh, yes. So, 